All right, everyone. This is going to sound like a conference uh, call center in a second. So let me double check where we are. How many people we have? 13. Uh, I don't know how many people can hear my wife talking, how many people can hear me talking, uh, how many people can hear a vacuum in the background. I'm going to, I might have to look for headphones or something like that to make this a bit cleaner, but she stole the headphones right now this morning. So, and she's giving a talk as well, which is I was unexpected. And we're both loud. So can you hear me? Can you hear my wife? And can you hear the vacuum is the question. Let me also. You learn all about service advisories, by the way, which is very nice. Okay. Let me let me check what it, what you guys said in the chat. Okay. Okay. How distracting is somebody talking in the background being? Maybe I can go right here. Idea. Hold on one second. You're going to get a screen that will be that is saying. So the first three fields, you can obtain through the cutting from the manager portal, where your first name, last name, and your email address. Uh, this is all from the manager portal. Uh, the first subscription, this is what you need to do. You can pick uh, a service of all your sites. They can pick as many as they want, or as few as they want, as long as they have one. You can pick as many as you want to the internet to provide. Okay, how's that now? Announcements are usually. Am I am I audible? And is it a bit quieter for hearing? She's talking the same volume as I am, so. And ASMR. What's an ASMR lecture, by the way? Async. And can and can people hear me? Because I can't say it. You can hear me. I, I really need response here, guys, because I don't no idea what you guys are hearing, and I want to make sure things are clear. I'm also turning off your sound just because. Uh, okay, good enough. We're going to go with that. And if it's too distracting, I'm going to be distracted enough by her. Uh, if it's too dis uh, if it's a problem, just let me know, uh, and we'll see where we can go from there. Which is ironic because today is about how to give a lecture. And this is, of course, the worst possible condition. Not only is it asynchronous, but my wife is talking and there's a vacuum cleaner nearby and a whole sorts of things. So this is going to be my, you know, testament to perhaps my testament of my, if I can give a lecture, or perhaps it's just going to be, you know, um, garbage on top of garbage. If the lecture wasn't very good, it's going to be extra garbage on top. I don't know. But we're going to, I'm going to go over the lessons I've learned over the years of giving countless lectures over, uh, surprising, you might be surprised by that because of my rambling. I actually like the rambling. I actually intentionally do a lot of it. I like the idea that education and learning is a bit of a messy thing. So in case you're wondering, there are, but there are particular rules and particular approaches to making a lecture that are uh, that are re useful. And if I'm giving a proper formalized talk, I give a very different lecture than what I give for just a normal university lecture. It's not that it's lower quality. Well, you know, the university lecture is lower quality or anything. It's purely because the university lecture is meant to be a bit wobbly. You're meant to have people ask you a question and you go, oh, I didn't think of that. Or, oh, let's explore that idea. That's the point of a university lecture. It's meant to be a bit more off the cuff. It's a bit more improvised. And I'm just talking to a microphone right now. <laughs> so it's meant to be a bit more improvised. And that in itself is something really interesting. And it's a lot more fun. A, a, a practice talk like you're going to be doing next Tuesday. A practice talk is uh, it's, a, it's a different beast. You can see what, how I give a practice talk sometimes. And it'll be point by Clearly, I am not following that pattern right now. I'm about to. But first, before I get into that practice talk idea, uh, I want to go over, hopefully, 
Anytime my mouse comes over here, there we go. There you go, focus. What's coming up? Just because the goat rodeo that was the P7 review. So I'd like to reiterate just for your sake. I don't want to flip and flop on this one. I, I, I just take a long time coming up with the, the reputation and trying to build up a reputation of being an absolute jerk and a hard ass. And then I come and try and look all soft and cuddly. No, I, I actually don't try and look like a hard ass. But the point is the university is challenging enough. It is meant to be challenging. It is meant to push you. It is meant to make you do things you never thought you could do. I think the projects at the end of the term, when you see them at the at, during the lab period today, when you look at each other's projects, you will know what I mean. Because I'm sure many of you did not expect you or your teammates or your, uh, I guess, classmates to be able to pull out or to be able to make something that off th this awesome. The fact that you've pushed yourself to this level and you have such amazing work in the end, or at least unless you've regressed and have broke all your code, but it was working before, the, the stuff I've seen so far has been great. Holy cow, a vacuum on top of all of this. Anyways, if, uh, if, if at the end of the day, uh, if you look at this and you realize how much you've pushed yourself, that's what we're aiming for. We're not aiming for getting you to um, cry or anything like that. And it's not meant to be me being intimidating. If you do not have instructions for something, you have every right to demand precise instructions. That's your job. It's not just your job. It's my job to produce it. But your job is to make sure you're graded fairly. So if you think you should have gotten points, legitimately gotten points, ask for it, right? Or ask about it. If you do not understand a concept, ask questions. That's their, your job as well. You were involved in your education versus if you were uh, doing so much like a telemarketing place, uh, versus it's not from me just coming up on from on high and throwing information at you. Part of it is this back and forth that you will now know now know things. And this is a weird concept for if you're, you know, only in your second year. Every time though, you will you should know more than your professor on a wide, wide variety of things in their area. Not just you know more about TikTok than I do, because you definitely know more about TikTok than I do. It you will know more about specific things about visualizations. You know how to more about Tableau than I will. That's okay because you're deep dove into it. That's sort of the point. I'm not going to know everything. I have the pathways. I have the general sort of map, topo the topography. If you want to look at, we're going to do a topographic map. No, we have, I have the topography of the area. I know where dead ends are. I've hit enough of these experiences to guide you, but the fiddly, the nit gritty details about something, I don't necessarily know. Yesterday, I was looking up how to do Q sort on in C. Now you might say, well, don't you already know that? And I said, yeah, I, I learned it. I learned it a year ago. I promptly forgot what, how to do it, all the syntax for it. I looked it up again. That's not a bad, that's not a sign of not knowing something. That's what you're expected. You, we're trying to teach you also how to think through problems and how to approach stuff. That was a big aside to go over with the, you deserve and have every right to demand instructions. Yes. And my wife's complaining about the instructions, uh, the, uh, the, the things. Um, so P7 is a usability test. First part due today at 10 a.m. today. That is you posting something about your system and the tasks you want people to do with it. They should know what to do, but you're not telling them, now click this part, now click this part. It is our thing lets you find skating rinks in the city of Ottawa. Go find a skating rink. Our system allows you to compare or see where, where a good time to invest is and patterns associated with COVID. Go do that. Our system allows you to find out what your commute time is to get to drop off your kids. Go do that. That's what you're, that's the kind of task we're talking about, not step by step. When people do it, they're supposed to find issues, not because you didn't have the time, attention to detail, but because you're never going to be perfect. And that's how you make your system better. D2 is their system, their reviews. They will review your system and say, I like this, I like this, I didn't like this. It should be positive, it should be supportive, it should be constructive. 
should be specific enough, like screenshots. If you want to really impress the people you review, give them some screenshots. I'm sure they will appreciate reading what you have. You can make a PDF and post it, you, whatever works for you. But it, you want to be clear so that the person knows what you're, that you're critiquing about their system. That's due on Sunday. And then at the end, at the same time as P9 is due, but really you can put it in P9 if you want, uh, the review of reviewers and the other, in the final review. It's just a timeline problem, but you just sort of have to, you know, close that loop. The idea is that you'd have a to-do list for your final project, which you should do before you do your final project, but the things you need to polish up before you're done, right? If everyone goes, oh my God, that icon sucks, change the icon before your P9 is due. High priority. This thing crashes when I look at it the wrong way. Fix that before P9 is due. Okay. Oh, I don't like the look of the color scheme here. Right? That's the opinion. You can future work, right? You, you prioritize what things you're going to do or what you would like to do. Okay. And then you can review your review. That's also part of it. So there's a third deliverable, which can be coming in as part of P9. A lot of people put it in P9. That is the review of the reviewers, because what you really want to be able to do is say, look, this person was completely unfair to me. That's, and they, it's not realistic what they were suggesting. You should be able to critique or defend yourself, if you will, not just take criticism and just be done with it. So P8, that is next Tuesday. I think we're going to do it. We're going to allot, allot it for in class time, perhaps. I don't know. I, I want to think about how we want to do this because I think I wanted to do asynchronous because it was hard for people to time things. But we have time for uh, you doing presentations. You'll be posting your presentations and then everyone's supposed to watch the presentation and post questions to each each group. You watch seven presentations and hopefully each presentation will get, you know, five to six questions. So other groups, the projects. That's why, so that's a great question. Uh, Zinian asked it, do we need to include individuals' feedbacks to other group projects in P7 submission, in P7 submission file? The P7, initial P7 submission to today, you don't have any feedback. The P7 submission at the end, the part three, uh, you can include the individual feedback, the group's feedback, or you just can be general what they said. We will, will have already read everyone else's feedback. Your feedback is posted on C, the CU Learn message board. So that's why everyone can see it. When you put, when you critique someone's work, they can see it. I can see it. You know, everyone can see it. Does that answer your question? So you don't have to include the exact quotes, uh, but if you want, that helps a lot. Right? It's, it's more clear. Someone says they didn't get the notification. Right. Check and then finally, the right. Then uh, and then finally for P9, that is your summative report at the very end of term. It is all the times you're, refer you're, you're referring to how you're doing your design, what takeaways you had, what went well, what went poorly, all of the take home lessons you should have. What you should be able to do is take your P9, pass it to, uh, pass it to somebody, maybe pass them the video as well, or the, the URL to your web page. But if you pass P9 and your and your visualization, they should know exactly what you did this term. All the gory details. It's not every last little page, but it should be, I read this, I know exactly how you went through your design process. What I'm looking for is what's called an artifact. It's an artifact that you can pass to future employers when they say, how do you design? You go, here you go, and then you're done. Right? You can summarize it later, but if they want the full gory details, you can give them that and justifying why you did what you did. There is also an individual report at the very end. The individual report is due, I think, the same time as the project report. These are all due the last day of class, the last possible moment. If you need an extension of a couple of days, let me know. I cannot extend it past. I can't make a due date past the last day or the last day of class. I'm not allowed to at all. It also screws up your final exams. So I don't do this unless the group says, I'm okay with screwing up my exams or I'm okay because I don't have any exams and I need a bit more time. So in that case, fine, but you have to let me know. Okay, and then finally there's the token use, which I'm sure many of you forgot. If you were late for uh, passing an assignment, you were supposed to, the TAs sort of 
you didn't follow the instructions that well on that one, uh, there was fine because it's fair, more fair, at least what they're doing. The being late for an assignment is supposed to get you a big fat zero temporarily. We're supposed to grade it. And then after, at the end of the term, what we want to be able to do is say, look, I didn't do this. Uh, I did either I didn't do this summer or I was late for this assignment. I'm going to use a token on it. You get two tokens a year, the term, and a token can be used for missing two classes. Like I didn't submit anything for the in-class activities for two classes. I can use it for being late for an assignment, or I can use it for not, I think I can even use it for not passing in an assignment. So the tokens are used for the flexibility that you need in life, like what we were dropping a certain number of assignments in 1400. You expect people are gonna break their arms, get sick, whatever the case is. The tokens are there to handle that kind of flexibility. That's what they're there for. Okay. And what you're going to be doing, I'm going to, we'll make a proper announcement about this later. The the tokens are you'll you'll be uh, I think you'll be writing to uh, Rami about this how you want to use your token. If you don't say how you want to use your token, we're just going to have some kind of algorithm. Excel. <laughs> we're going to have some kind of Excel document, and we're just going to play around with have a bunch of conditionals in there so that. It's trying to maximize your points, but we don't guarantee that. So if you want to make sure your points are maximized, stay how you want to use your tokens. If you think, oh, well, I missed two assignments. I want to, I want to use that instead of, uh, I, I missed two assignments. I want to use that instead of using it for a missed submission, uh, in-class submission. Great, tell us. That way you're in control of your own academic. Uh, performance okay. okay here we go now with all this chaos i've never had this much chaos even in even in the crap situation that is vacuuming right outside our door and stuff like that in the past but to do it for the final presentation is real like how to give a presentation is exceptionally weird but let's get going i'm going to be talking about how to give a presentation and I'm going to try and make a presentation that is how to give a presentation using the techniques for how to give a presentation. With me so far? So it's very, it's very, very meta. It's how to give a presentation using the format that I'm describing for how to give a presentation. And once we're done with that, then we'll just go to the lab idea. So for me, when I'm making, trying to make a presentation, there's well, you need to grab attention. You also have to have a particular purpose in mind. And then when, and your whole point of your presentation is you're driving that purpose. That might be explanations about your system. In your case, it might be your research hypothesis and what they take away for your research is. So I tend to like starting off with a big bold scene, even before I go for a course outline, something to grab people's attention, to make them wake up and go like, it's not just another presentation. So something, maybe a big image, something like that. And it could be public domain images or something you found online like this. Now, my question to you is, what's wrong with this image? And I will wait. Yes, it's not a file. It's an internal Leon not a file. And one thing that happens is, um, using smart orchestration, the early alerts to consumers can be sent. Um, but this is automatic. Can you be more clear? And that's why I'm going to Kind of looks Gandalf. It is Gandalf. Nice. That's one. Kara, Kara is completely right, by the way. Uh, Empire Strikes Back is not Gandalf, and it's not the before not Star Wars. Okay, yeah. And then from that point on, what else? I've done uh, support management is supposed to form the API bit, and then you hear us sending the. Uh, so kind of looks like Gandalf suggests that it's not Dumbledore. Right. So therefore, it's not Star Wars either, which is Empire. And oh yes, it may be the end. Sure, sure as hell, Dumbledore never said peer, peer, people fear public speaking more than death. That's for sure. And uh, and that quote never comes from Dumbledore. And perhaps more importantly, maybe no one has ever said that. And there may be actually no statistical backings, despite Jerry Seinfeld having a routine about that. Jerry Seinfeld's routine is about rather being in rather being in the casket than giving the eulogy. Right. The whole thing is bull poop. I love the fact that you can have something that is so full of lies that it's layers of, of lies. I love that idea. 
The point being, it's on about public speaking. It got us talking, but on top of that, I would like to point out, if you disagree with me, that's fine. I can be wrong. I might not, you can, you should be skeptical when you're going into a talk. You should be skeptical of what, you, what you're hearing and keep an open mind and be critical about what you hear, including when someone gives you a quote like, people fear public speaking more than death. It might be a load of horse poop. So therefore, just keep an open mind while you're doing it. This is just, I'm not going to guarantee that it's going to be the best talk ever. Why? Because my wife's talking in the background. I'm not going to guarantee that I'm not going to go on and on at all during the talk. That's fine. It's a, a thought process that you can go through. If this is something I'm hoping will be useful for the rest of your academic career. So I tend to like a little course outline, but, but I tend to avoid these all often because I find people go, Outline, okay. central premise, get uh, start general, narrative structure, slightly more specific. Most people don't even read these things. They do provide a very useful thing because if you have a really long talk, people like seeing where they are on the very long talk. That's fine. But just reading out your outline, not if you, if you keep it punchy, that's fine. This is probably too much for me to be reading out at any given time. What I'd like to point out about all this is we're going to go from this very general to the specific and back out to the general again, because that's how we write papers. It's also how we give talks. So we're going to go through all of these various points, including I'm not going to be able to do the mini wake up. So uh, I'm sure you're not going to be upset by the mini wake up whatsoever, but there is a mini wake up in here. Uh, and we'll go over some of the very uh, specific stuff. And by the way, I am, this is not a full oh, academic talk. You're not being paid for this. I know, crazy. So if you want to steal some images online, go right ahead. Leave the watermark. I don't care. We're not expecting you maybe cite where you got it from. If you give me something that looks like and you claim it as your own, that's academic integrity violation. This is clearly not my image. That's okay. Uh, if you want to use someone else's image and it's clearly and they have a watermark, leave the watermark on so that we know you didn't make it yourself. That's fine. We know that you have a limited time. Okay, so this is what my central premise is going to be. That when you're saying, when you're giving a talk, you have to more than just words and a bunch of slides. It is not throwing slides at people and hoping they absorb it. You have a central premise that everything hangs off of. Think of it like a string that you're hanging weights off of. Everything, and I mean everything, is in service of that central premise. Much like you had a system where we were talking about our, our system, our visualizations that we're making, I said, what is the task? Everything is based on the task. Who is a user? What is their task? Build the system based on that. It's a central premise of your system. For our talks, we have a central premise, which is what is a user's task? What are they trying to do with it? How does my visualization serve that purpose? That's going to be most of your central premises. But for Gantman talk, you should always have one thing that's driving everything home. You can't talk about 20 things. You cannot give them all the brilliant stuff you've done in your research. Nobody will follow it. So you'll want to, but that's a kiss of death. I've seen it enough times. Have central flow, uh, so everything, the flow of the talk, everything is designed around this premise. The up and down flow is based off of how it relates to that central premise. For most narratives, for most talk, uh, for most, you'll get something like an exposition, some kind of explanation at the very beginning, the boring part, as my kids would call it. Then you get some kind of rising action. This is when the action star goes around shooting everybody, right? Until they meet the person on the top of Yokotomi, uh, Yokotomi Tower, die hard, die hard. Um, right? When, 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 uh, when you fall off Yokotomi Tower, so you have climax, and then it, you have some kind of falling action. Now, this is the sort of general concept of a, of a narrative structure. That falling action is a lot shorter normally, and there might be some wobble in the rising action, but it's generally what we're doing. And there's a resolution where everyone gets together and everyone holds hands and stuff like that. I mean, the resolution for the Lord of the Rings is a half a book. It's, it's ridiculously long. It involves, you know, the scouring of the Shire and stuff, but it's still, the ring is gone 
and they're still doing other stuff, just resolving stuff for a while. So if someone subscribes and then you put the John Cole number, what we might want to do is have a little introductory context. Is a Bond movie is a classic example of that. This little poppy scene at the very beginning where you see some action to get people excited before you go like, and now let me tell you about all of this other stuff that happened, right? Before all the exposition. But really, narrative structure is not necessarily like that. If you look at narrative structure for a talk in particular, you get this is, well, you get this particular pattern. It's not the same as a normal narrative. For a talk, what you get is some exposition, what we're trying to talk about, what the current state of affairs is. Okay. And when she okay. was looking so at this, this you get this pattern. What could be? She studied a whole lot of great talks, like the great talks of the 20th century, and examined their narrative structure. Similarly, I'm sure she could even go back to the last 100 years as well. They all sort of follow that same sort of pattern. Some kind of exposition, some kind of warm up, some kind of start. What the current state of affairs is, bang, what you could get if you change your behavior. Then back down to what current thing is. Back up to what could be. My typical fault or problem when I give a talk is that I always I ramp I go from zero to sixty and I stay at sixty right? or even faster. I just go ramp up full and I never go back down. The going back down is what gets you. You get numb to all the screaming and shouting and all this energy if you just go all build the the barney stinson's mixtape is all build now it's not all build you have to go up and down because otherwise you don't know when you are build up again you get you get numb to it ideally at the end of one of these talks you have walk away from here do this thing change voting rights um our march on washington does this I, the I had a dream speech was part of her analysis, for example. What would we get if we made this change in our world? That's what we're aiming for. And that's what you leave everyone with. What they can do, not what the current state is, but what you want in the world or what you want your research to have conveyed, how much better it is than the previous version. That's what you want to walk away with. We can do one better though. And instead of just doing this flat up and down, you can also build your what is, what could be over and over and over again. And then have a little resolution at the end, but you're still, it's energetic and then you get the heck off the stage. It builds up and it doesn't, it goes and it can go down, but it's still build, 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 build. That's what we're looking for. And in case you're wondering, if you haven't watched this speech, watch it, watch it again. If you have watched it before and you haven't seen it in a couple of years, Watch it again. And then I watched it again this past fall. I went, oh, that's why I was such a fan. It is a beautiful speech. It is a spectacularly good speech. I mean, there have been a lot of great speeches, but that thing, it just, it follows that narrative structure and drives home those points. And it has the ups and downs. It has the calm downs and it builds it right back up again. It is what we're talking about. I'm not expecting you to give me this on Tuesday, but that's what we're talking about. I would like you, so number one rule for me though, is you have to be yourself. You are not Barack Obama. I know, I know that might be a surprise to many of you, but you are not Barack Obama. You are not the 44th president of the United States. You are not a famously world famous order or anything like that. You are you. And what you want to be, and I'm going to try and get the photo off as soon as I can, but still, I want you to be who you are. So can anyone tell me who this is? Try to not grow short too much, but anyone know who this is? It's a bit macabre now, but by the way, this is the what it, how it is before I build it up again. So, if you want to see what my narrative structure is, so who is this? Is it a crazy, crazy guy living under a bridge somewhere? It is not a crazy guy living under a bridge somewhere, by the way. Why don't we just take a guess if you don't know? Random guesses. I've got some great guesses in the past. 
So you had no more trouble feeling you. You were told you're uh, fine, the incident, that you can't do maybe this one. And then you have the different... Come on, somebody answer. So then you can tell... This is not a spectator sport. That's pretty much all I had, I think. So, any questions for me? Nothing. Good enough guess. Thank you. <laughs> I need somebody. Come on. That is a very good okay. guess, Kara. Uh, and it does look like Shaggy from Scooby Doo. And I'm sure the same amount of plot was consumed for the, by this person as well. Uh, he does look like a musician because he is. And it is a he, although people have compared him to the crazy cat lady from The Simpsons. Uh, looking the same. That, if you can believe it, is Eddie Van Halen. This is Eddie Van Halen when he was nice and low in his life. Eddie Van Halen was a raging alcoholic and a chain smoker. Uh, did a whole bunch of other drugs, but alcohol was his drug of choice. And despite the fact he is world famous, one of the world's best guitarists and had millions upon millions of dollars and was married to a supermodel, this is what he ended up looking like. The reason I'm pointing this out is it is still Eddie Van Halen. It is always Eddie Van Halen. But when he came up, this was sort of his low point when everyone was showing, he showed up to an awards ceremony like this and everyone went, mm. okay, you want to look your best, just a better self. This is Eddie Van Halen years and years later. He cleaned up his act. He's actually older in this photo. He's still not, you know, young 20 year old Eddie Van Halen, but they changed his teeth, they fixed his teeth, they got him a haircut, they fixed this, they fixed that. He's on the wagon, at least I think he was for a long while. He died, unfortunately, he died recently of, I can't remember, I think it was a cancer, uh, liver cancer, instead of drinking, actually. Um, but what's interesting about Eddie Van Halen is that this is the same person. Now, which one of those people do you want to be, really? My point is, you are still yourself. You just want to put your best presentation of yourself forward so that other people can see who you are. You can't hide who you are. Faking your identity is extremely hard. At least I'm assuming it is. Not that I am faking my identity, no. Um, so you want to play to your strengths. I am not going to be able to play very serious and very, uh, you know, Dip up a lip and, and very organized. I play with who I am. I'm very passionate. I'm very talkative. I'm very boisterous. I use that. I try to compensate for my weaknesses, which is my scatterbrain nature, by playing to some of my strengths. Your passion ultimately drives their attention, even if it's a quiet passion. You don't have to be screaming and shouting, but your passion shows through. And that's what people get interested in. If you love your research, let people know that you love your research. If you are proud of your system, let people know you're proud of your system. You don't have to say, I am proud of my system. It will come out. Don't try and hide it. Don't put a, a damper on it. Let people see that because that's what we're gonna, that's what's gonna get us to pay attention. It's innate in our, our DNA to look at people when they're passionate about things. It's more interesting with where the interesting stuff is. And more important thing out of all this, what keeps coming back is if you practice that enough, that's how you make it your own. It takes time to have a personality for yourself. And you're not worrying about the words that you're going to be saying or anything like that. It has to be the only way to make it your own is to say it enough. So my wife, um, she's going to smack me in about two seconds here. She was applying to the real, uh, great Canadian baking show because the kids told her that she had to. I don't think she really necessarily wants to, but she's a fantastic baker. She just always want to be on camera. Um, but at the same time, she, you know, gave her talk. Yeah, it's okay. She did it four or five times. By the end of those four or five times, then I saw my wife, right? It was, she was coming through in the talk she was giving. That's what you're looking for. I want to know who you are when I see your talk. And that takes practice. So speaking of being your best self, these three gentlemen here are three of my mentors from Northeastern. I just picked them because they were big influences on me and also just they're fantastic public speakers. They're fantastic professors. They're what I look up to, if you will. So on the left is uh, Kevin Gold. Uh, so he does AI work. 
He's the only person I've ever met who was, uh, he left Google because the people around him were not smart enough, honest to God. Uh, it wasn't like he was doing it arrogantly. He was just like, it's really frustrating when people are not able to figure out that. He was saying it without, you read between the lines, you're like, oh, um, you were frustrated with them not being smart enough. Okay. Uh, incredibly smart, incredibly quiet. Amit Chesh, you sit at the back of the class when he was, when, when he was going to school in India does not like public speaking whatsoever. Great public speaker. Now, Kevin, very, very quiet, talks to a squirrel girl all the time, very, very nerdy. He wears his nerdiness on his sleeve. He's not loud and boisterous like I am. He always seems to be mic'd up. Incredibly smart, incredibly meticulous, fully owns his nerdiness. And he's just, everyone loves, they just sit back and listen to him calmly say things. Amit is, is Similar to me, he's very, you know, fair bit boisterous, not as boisterous as I am, but he gives these great little examples as you go along for like why you can't focus on two things at once in a 3D space when you're talking about 3D graphics. And he had everyone, you know, put their thumb up and look at their thumb and tell how things look behind you. Simple little demonstrations that make a world of difference in what you understand in, cl in the classroom. He plays to his strengths. And this is Ben Hescott. He is the current associate dean of student, I, I don't know what is a proper title. He changed it a bunch of times. He's more like me, but the better version of me. He's loud, he's boisterous, he's energetic, he's running around the classroom. He's extremely passionate about teaching. He's what I would be if I was better, <laughs> essentially. Right? He's this fantastic prof. Uh, and, but he plays to his strengths because he's like me. He's very loud and boisterous and energetic. Radically different. Be yourself, but there's a better version of yourself or there's a best version of yourself for public speaking. That's what you're aiming for. Mm -hmm. So let's get to something else. So be yourself is one lesson one. Lesson two is just audio visual. So this, I have to tell people, and many of you go, well, of course, duh, but sometimes not so much. In fact, my son's learning the wrong stuff. So first of all, your slides, you will not get, be able to get all your information across. You did a lot of work on this project. You will do, have done a lot of work on whatever project you're working on. They won't retain everything. You cannot drink from the fire hose. Any fool can make something complex. It takes real skill to pare it down, including me. I mean, I could, should be able to sh cut out a whole lot more of this speech. The, is this isn't the message. And one of the things you have to tell students when they're doing research is that they spend six months or a year working on something. They get 20 minutes to tell them what they did in that then you know, that six months to a year. And you don't tell people what you did. You just get them excited so they read your paper. It's meant to be a commercial for your paper. Your presentation on Tuesday is a commercial for your visualization. It is what you did so we understand what's going on. We get the picture. But if we want the exact details, we'll look at your code. We'll look at your paper. This is an advertisement. You cannot drink from the fire hose. You have to give a little bit at a time. You have to guide people. You have a central premise. You're guiding along that central premise. Speaking of fire hose, what not to do with audiovisual? Uh, notice all the things that I'm doing wrong that we now know why we're doing it wrong. So I so how do we look at shape and look at text. We use luminance as a channel. Oh, wait, the audio visual, what not to do is it's almost the same luminance as the background. There's a pattern in the background that's hard to tune out because it's, they have the same level of uh, contrast between the background pattern and the text on top of it, making it harder to read at least, despite the fact it's not impossible to read, but it's a pain in the ass, right? We have a whole bunch of extra glaring stuff on the side here. And then my personal favorite, the animated transition for no reason, which they're actually teaching my son to do in school. Absolutely not. And how many of you, more importantly, are listening to me at all right now? Yep. Probably about two of you. Maybe someone's listening to me because you're not looking at the slides yeah, at all. Yes. Maybe, right. The reason you don't listen to me when you, there's, there's a big animating slide up here is because we know, actually, let me take move that off so let me animate transition away boom translating big animated transition for no reason 
remember that motion is pre-attentive. We cannot tune it out. We have to actively use cognitive resources to tune out motion. For someone like me, that's exceptionally hard. It's something with my condition. Uh, but motion is something that we naturally focus on. And if you have any motion on your screen and you're trying to talk, just be aware they're not listening to a damn word you said. Okay. That's the reason why we make sure these, why animated transitions are bad within reason. A little bit is fine, but if it bounces in or explodes in, you're just distracting them for no apparent reason, for no purpose, and you're taking away from your central premise. Again, everything is about aiming for your central premise. So if I see a wall of code like this, no one wants to look at your damn code, take it off the screen. You will go to a conference at some point in time where you will see someone give a talk at you know work or wherever you are. At some point in time, you will see this, and I'm hoping you remember today. They will put a wall of nitty gritty details, like here's the formula for my math equation. Here is all the things I did. Here is this dumping of information. Get that crap off the screen. No one wants to see it. Get rid of it. It's about the central premise. And if you're giving me a bunch of code, unless that one line of code is the critical piece of information for everyone, get it off the screen. No one wants to read it. No one's going to read it. Go stop doing it. Okay. So I'm going to talk about walls of text because okay. this is the thing that everyone does in undergrad. So please put up your hand, do a reaction on the thing. Hopefully we'll see it here. I'll see if I can get a proper grid layout here. Uh, so there's not that many people here. It's really exciting. Um, there's, so please put up your hand if you have a reaction when you have finished reading this text. Yeah, I, I this is not a substitute for knowing your speech. If you're reading your slide, you have full sentences or generally just have too much information no one is listening to, they are just reading your slides. More importantly, people will correctly conclude that you have just read your slides instead of listening. Uh, uh, instead of listening to you, at least. Your job is to make an interesting and interactive presentation that attracts people to want to learn more. Again, put up your hand when you finish reading the slides. No one put up their hand. I'm really disappointed, guys. You should be able to put do a reaction, this little hand up reaction. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. I am shocked that it's taking you this long to put up your hand, though. You can put your hands down again, but I don't know about you. But every time I've ever done a talk, and someone's done this, what do you do? You read all their bullet points before they get a chance. And then they say, oh, I better put bullet points to animate in. No, don't put all your text on the thing. You can put the bullet no. points, that's fine. You should need the talk as well. If you just read it, you're not doing it right. So that's what we're aiming for. You should have to, you should have, to have the rest of the talk in order to make sense of the bullet points. Not Really, you should be able to look at it again afterwards and go, oh, that's what he was talking about there, or that's what she was talking about there. But you, if you have a wall of text, you're just going to read, and they're not listening to you anymore. It's like the animated transition. So, so okay. the one of the rules so is I don't read your notes. If you have a notes, you're reading your notes, you will read like this, and it will sound like a robot. Now, there is one little caveat. You can probably read your notes when you're doing a presentation online. That seems reasonable. But if for a live presentation, you sure as hell should not be reading your notes. And they should be bullet points. You need to practice to get rid of all of the nervousness and all the uhs and uhs. You need to make it, even if it's not your first language, it just requires a lot of practice. The big thing is, uh, unless you need to, is the caveat. It is better to read your notes uh, yeah. than to be completely lost and not have anything to say. But the better thing yet, so there's no practice, no reading notes, reading notes, actually practicing doing a good job. So that's what we're aiming for. Uh, part of this, though, is also noting your audience. This is actually remarkably hard to find an image for, so it's not the perfect image. I wanted to say, you know, inappropriate things like a clown at a funeral. Turns out clown funerals are a very different, weird thing. Clowns actually, people that are that are into clowning, all the other clowns that they know will show up in clown makeup for a funeral. It's, they do that on, on uh, Modern Family as well. It's just a little bit odd. Uh, but the idea is that if you were showing up 
if you're wearing a scantily clad outfit to a funeral, like if you go out clubbing in a suit and tie, yeah. right? I went once to a goth bar with this bright polka dot shirt. Very, you know, people are like, well, who the hell is this guy? Know your audience, know who's around you and adjust accordingly. So what do you guys want to learn? You guys are a very different program than when I teach this to CS. What do you already know, right? I'm not assuming that you have a back programming background like I did with my CS students, but you have more of a, a more of the social science part of the background than my computer scientists did. Okay, you know, are you paying attention? That's what kills me about this. I can't tell when you guys are paying attention. Excellent. Thank you. I have to assume certain things, but that's why these online talks well, stink because I can't tell. Uh, when can you take a joke? Again, I can't tell right now. You have to be able to read the room. And that is a skill that comes with practice. And But you prepare your slides based off of what you know about your audience. When I set expectations, when they are set, it's really hard to change your mind. So if you think I'm going to stick in the mud at the beginning of the term, I'm not going to change that for a long time. It's going to take a lot of more work to change your mind than it is to set the initial expectation. So this would be about the time. Uh, this would be about the time when I wake everyone up. I've been talking for a while. I want to bring things back down or bring it back up. I guess I haven't been able to shout as much as I normally do because my wife's in the room. Uh, normally about this time, I wake people up and it would be something like, oh, wait, we've been doing this all term like an in-class exercise where we were submitting some of our work. It's something to break up the monotony. Because even at 20 minutes, I've lost half of your attention. So you want to bring up some kind of concept. You want to keep something interesting. You want to throw in an image. You want to throw something to just break them out. If you're just giving them 20 minutes of what your research is, you don't have them for 20 minutes. You had them for the first five. Take some, not, a, not an actual break, not like a, hey, let's go just chat about random things. Just something to break up the monotony. So normally for this, when I do it for this, this talk for my grad students at the beginning of uh, their grad seminar course, I would say who, what my name is, where my hometown is, and something interesting about myself. And then I go around the room to do that. I'm not doing that here. I know most of you guys. But I would like you to point out why we do this. We did the in-class exercises, not just because we get to apply what we've just learned, not just because it is uh, something interesting and it gets to, it's actually has a utility to it. You, that's why you were expected to actually do it, by the way. Not only does it get us talking about things or getting you applying it and then the critiquing what, the work you did, but it also breaks up the monotony. It has multiple different purposes, and that's why we had that. So I'm breaking up monotony now, breaking up the monotony. There you go. I'd like to point out that besides the audiovisual, besides practicing, besides not reading your slides, besides having a central purpose, you're presenting information. And for your presentations on Tuesday, you do not need to show your face necessarily. I'm a little disappointed with that because I think it's a huge part of the art form that is public speaking. Something I'm not doing particularly well here because of the microphone here. But while you're public speaking, there's a whole lot going on. This is actually something that my, my son struggles with. He's on the autistic spectrum. It's just something that's actually a difficult thing for him to actually you know, make eye contact, keep eye contact, that sort of thing. He doesn't really see a need for it. You are the one presenting. People want to hear you. So part of what we're talking about here is your body language is telling you something. We'll talk about body language in a second. But while you're presenting, people are listening to you. That's scary. But you might as well speak clearly, confidently, and ideally loudly. I can't do the loudly thing. My wife's right here. I'm going to blow out her eardrums. I like to point. So, so let me do the demo this way. I would like to point out that no matter what I do, no matter how long the pause is, you are still listening. No one has actually interrupted me 
or said anything. In fact, I can actually do that demonstration that I just did, that those unnatural, ridiculously long pauses. I can do those in a live class and nobody has ever once, hey, I wanna say something. No one's interrupted me during that. Quiet out, give your talk with your teammates and throw in one. It was one of the most revolutionary experiences that I've ever done. I was talking about, uh, I think, verbal cues for an HCI class. And I give that demonstration just off the cuff and then realized all this time I've been putting ums and ahs in my speech and there's no need for those fillers. If you're the one speaking, you have their attention. There's no need for a placeholder to say that what you want to say next. You can actually just take a pause if you need to. Not five minute pause, but there's no need for ums and ahs. It takes practice though, to get out of the habit that you've been building up over, your, over the years. Your first time pre practicing your presentation or giving your presentation is never your first time. If you're given the demo, that shouldn't be your first take. It should be like your 17th take, especially for a live presentation. And you need to be comfortable. Things are, they were not, it's not scripted. It's not, it's not random. It, there's something in between. Like, um, I'm trying to think of it, like any of the, uh, uh, I want to see Jude Law, not Jude Law, uh, <laughs> like the 40-year-old virgin or my knocked up or any of those. I'm just trying to remember the, the, the director's name. I, I know him. I know, you know, I know his work well, but I'm just blanking right now. It's like any other movies where there's a certain amount of improvisation, but there's still a script involved. So in terms of body language, what we're talking about, you don't have to be as and wavy as I am, but it does convey some meaning. So meaning your fingers out of your pockets, don't be fiddling around with stuff, don't be, you know, that's not so good, right? It all conveys information. There's information being conveyed by your hands, by your body language. You're not hiding behind a podium. You should be, you're conveying some information. That's conveying information. That's conveying information. That's conveying information. All of it conveys something, whether, whether you want it to or not. You might as well be intentional. What we're trying to avoid is distracting body movement, unless that's what your point is. If I'm doing this, you're paying attention to that, at least if you're looking at the video of me. Movement itself can engage, but it can distract. And so you're trying to talk, you're trying not to hide, you're committed. But frankly, what are the two things, biggest fears for me? Being naked uh, in public, and skydiving. So if you're jumping out of a plane, you might as well be naked. Right? If you're already terrified, you might as well just commit. Who cares if you're naked, if you're jumping out of a plane, you're committed, you're jumping out of a darn airplane. If you were afraid of public speaking, there's no point hiding behind the podium or being, you know, fidgeting with your hands. Just you're, commit. It's scary as heck. Go for it. There's not, what's the worst that's going to happen? You're going to be more scared. The number one rule, and this is so, in case you think it's just me, TED Talks, 10 Commandments, number eight is don't read your talk, right? Be yourself, be natural. All of the TED Talks, top 10, uh, 10 Commandments, all fall into the same sort of thing that I'm talking about. In fact, Michelle Borkin has a whole bunch of presentation tips of her own, again, falling in line with what we're talking about. So practice, 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 watch lots of talks for good role models, breathe, it's a big one. Her thing is never apologize. <clears throat> I think it depends on who you are. I think that's part of my shtick, but maybe I shouldn't apologize so often. Uh, but the big thing, have a clear message. Have an aha moment, especially if there is an aha moment. And you have to know your audience. But these are all what we've already talked about. I'm just pointing out that this is, not, I'm not reinventing the wheel here. I've come up with my own, but it falls completely in line with what other people do talk about when giving talk. The big point is that we have a particular structure to work off. We have an introduction. We have a bunch of rising action. We have some kind of climax. We have ups and downs in our talk. We have dynamics in our talk. But, oh, let me put that. For our presentation that we're doing on Tuesday, you've got a 20 minute talk, max, max, hard max of 20 minutes. Don't give me 25, don't give me 24. You'll lose points if you do that. 18, fine. 
17, fine. It doesn't have to be 20 minutes. It has to be enough that you've covered everything you wanted to cover. Everyone on the team should talk. The presentate, there's a live demo of your presentation. That could just be the video that you just attach with it, or it could be part of your presentation. That's fine. You do need that two minute video demo always at the end of term to be able to pass off to somebody. And at the end, we're going to, uh, you want to make sure you're mo walking through your motivating what your problem is, what the, you know, what the motivations are, what the data set is, how you design things, uh, showing the brief presentation of your sketches. They're all telling us how you got to that end state. That's what we're looking for on the Tuesday talk. For my take home lesson, I like to think of the fact that people have a really short memory. You're not going to remember half this talk. I'm okay with that. You want a central takeaway, which is that you need a central takeaway in my case, that you have a central idea that everything hangs off of, how much you prepare, what you're talking about, knowing who your audience is, how they can, how they will handle that central takeaway, how you give your, your what's your body language, everything's in service of that central takeaway. The slides shouldn't be distracting if, unless they're unintentionally distracting. Your speech pattern shouldn't be distracting unless it's intentionally distracting. I shouldn't be hitting a table like that. And you're trying to present your best self so that it doesn't take away from that central talk. You want to walk away at the end of the day with an idea in everyone's mind and then provide some kind of content information because ideally you got them excited and they want to contact you to know more. That's for an academic talk at least. What you really need is some kind of takeaway message, the one thing that people take away, such as great talks don't happen by accident. They take practice and intentionality. With that, I will leave you. There you go. That would be my, how I would end my talk. I'm, what we're going to do now, we're going to take a little break. And when we come, we're stopping a little early, actually. When we come back next, uh, at the end of this, we're going to be doing the usability test. That doesn't have to be live. I'm going to sit around on the Zoom call and in case you have any questions. But we will be reviewing, you'll be doing the usability test for at least two other groups and giving them feedback. The time is reserved for that. So in case you're thinking we don't have enough time, the lab time is for that. If you don't do it now, don't complain about the fact you didn't have time to do that. All right. The point of this is if you give the other groups feedback, you can help them improve their systems. That's what we're looking for. On Tuesday, you'll be giving, or at least presenting your talks. If anybody wants to do live talks versus a recorded talk, please let me know. I'm okay with either of them because we can record the live one and have other people see it afterwards. Uh, but the, from my remembering, uh, from my, from my memory on this thing, most people didn't want to have a live talk. They wanted to do, uh, recorded talks, which is a little surprising sometimes. Some people like doing live talks. It doesn't require you doing all this extra video editing. Uh, but if you want to do a live talk, let me know. Otherwise, I'm assuming people are recording things. And we'll spend the last lecture taking the time to, uh, to watch our, the live talks. You won't necessarily even do a live class. We'll just You'll just watch the live talks and post questions. If your question is clearly answered in the live talk, it means you didn't listen. Um, so... Right. I expect everyone to watch everyone else's live talk and ideally ask a number of questions. The re that is part of your participation rate. I'll be counting the number of questions you ask, meaningful questions that you ask, not silly questions. Okay. With that, I'm going to pause. I'm going to stop the video and stop recording. Uh, Lily, do you have a question actually, or is it just put up your hand from the earlier part of the presentation? I can actually turn on my video again. Uh, message board. So do, uh, do we post them on the message board uh, in class or lab section on C-Learn? Oh, I would say the class one, the the lab. Uh, yeah, I would. I don't think I even set up a message board on the lab space. Yeah, don't worry about it. It's all good. I asked you to put up your hand during the thing. It's whether you took it down. It's my bad for not, you know, finding that earlier. Okay, so you would post it on the main CU Learn post like P7 colon, and then, you know, uh, 
in your case, the best group or the red light group or however you want to identify yourself uh, so that people know that you have a usability test up there. Any other questions? By the way, that was approximately a 20 minute talk with a bit of extra fluff in there about, you know, outlines, that sort of thing. So it's probably on the closer to 30 minutes of the actual talk. If you want rough sense of how much you can cover, what you're covering, that sort of thing for your talk. It needs to be thorough enough that you cover all your bases, but make sure you time it to make sure it's not over 20 minutes. No one wants to see a 30 minute talk about your presentation. You're just going to annoy your classmates. So. All right. No other questions. In that case, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to stop recording. And I will, we, what we'll do is when we, I'm just going to be back here and you guys, uh, everyone can do the usability testing during the lab period. <laughs>